Brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Happy, happy Friday, everybody. You are back here with Made the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I am Scott, your host for today, for the next hour. For as long as you'll have me, really. And a man who's just back from the E3 show in Los Angeles, where I um, I got a chance to play some really cool virtual reality games. And I had the very real experience of my very first all-gender bathroom at the LA Convention Center. And back at the uh, Intertalk uh, HQ, at the, at the big HQ in La Jolla, California, where all of the bathrooms are for musicians only, then they enforce that policy strictly, is Paul B. Paul, how's it going, man? Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, our, our bathrooms are especially acoustically designed for you know singers, musicians. You you can't use it on if on, unless you could hit like a, uh, you know a concert concert C. There you go. That's the password. That's how, that's how you get in. So so at the L.A. Convention Center, Paul, I uh, I went to the E3 show, and there were me and thousands and hundreds of thousands of my friends uh, closely packed in in close quarters. And um and I had to use the restroom and so I went to I went to the bathroom and it has like uh like three symbols on it you know it would and and uh you know men women and 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 another one I'm guessing but um <laughs> and the sign I, I that like, says abandon all hope you enter here I, I guess so and it was like an all it was an all gender bathroom and so I went well you know I don't care I mean you know let, let's let's do this in other words so I I you know I I went in the bathroom and and dude I I kid you not. Uh, a a woman came in also to the bathroom, uh, which is a a unique sociological feeling because uh, you, you're you're there, you're going to the bathroom. You're not you're not used to people being in the bathroom with mm-hmm. you, people of the opposite sex especially. And she went into the stall, and the stall's locked, but the urinals are open. Right. So uh, oh, I'm so they get going, privacy, but you don't get privacy. Uh, so it's not really egalitarian, though, is it? There's like no, there was no privacy for me. That's what I'll say. I was in an all gender bathroom and everybody was checking me out. I was like, "Hey, man, what the hell?" <sighs> you know, it was. Was there an option of going to a traditional bathroom, or you just got to deal with it? No, there. I guess there was. You know, it was just the closest bathroom, and I, I kind of told myself I was like, "Well, I'm, I'm, an, you know, I don't care, you know, you know." But then I, I have to say, it's the, it's the first all gender bathroom I've used, um, where, uh, both men and women were in there at the same time. And, uh, you know, we might want to look at those rules again because, uh, the, the current, the old system worked pretty well, yeah. you know, the, the, the men's and women's and, and putting everybody in the same bathroom. And I guess maybe unless the bathroom just locks, maybe the whole thing should have just like locked and then you have privacy and, 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 you know, whatever, uh, what, whatever gender you are. Great. But, but, um, it is a little strange to have kind of mixed company in the bathroom. Yeah. It's very strange. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's how it's. I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of this this whole thing for being force fed down everybody's throat. Exactly. Now, and maybe that could be the next virtual reality video game. You go in, you have to pick which gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to suggest gonna that too. in the bathroom, or yeah. or it could be mixed <laughs> bathrooms, but then everyone is is the same gender. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Go. You get there to you, you get to pick. That's that. That's good. That'll work. Don't you imagine there's like aliens looking down on us going. We feel like your species is just about advanced enough to make contact with us. Oh crap! They can't decide which bathroom to use. <laughs> that, you know, and it's like you guys go back to uh, you, you know you were getting ready to pass like go and collect two hundred dollars and in, in terms of the uh, you know human advancement to another species, and then now that we can't decide which bathrooms we're going to use, now we're like back at the start of the of the sorry board. Yeah, don't you think? Well, uh... If if it's aliens, I think they're just experimenting on us just to see what 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 that could happen. be too. And then they have conversations. They're like, "Hey, Bob, uh, I was down there, and uh, there's this, and they can't decide which bathroom to use." I know, right? <laughs> I know, I know. It's they're so primitive. Uh, we our research shows that 15 percent of humans pee their pants while trying to decide <laughs> <laughs> which, whether or not to go into exactly exactly. Well, but, anyway, I I digress, but I just wanted to say that it was 
that's a weird one. That was a, that was strange. You know, I know you see, everybody wants to be supportive and you see it on the news stuff, but when you're there peeing and there are other people using the bathroom next to you, um, you can be as open and as honest as you want, but it is weird because we're not used to having people of the opposite sex watch us pee that aren't, you know, married to us, you know, and then you don't care. And then you're like, whatever, just don't, you know, don't start the show without me before I come back. You know, it's a, it's, it's a different set of needs, honestly. That's what yeah. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm not a big fan of of this stuff. I mean, I don't have anything against, you know, any kind of gender identity whatever people identify uh with yeah, but yeah. but the the way right this is being kind of like pushed into the foreground uh I I think it's kind of like look how pr- progressive uh uh, we are, but you know, real inequalities and real problems kind of get swept under the rug, and I, th- I don't think that's where we should start with. Yeah, no kidding. Well, that was interesting. I had to share it, and uh, of course, I was up there at the E three show, and I played a lot of very, very, very cool video games. Did you know that the wait for um, uh, Mario Odyssey, Odyssey, the new um, Nintendo Switch game that's coming out, was a uh, six and a half hours at one point? Wow, for like six and a half like, for like three minutes yeah, of gameplay for like. Three minutes and you get like a hat. I was like, you know what? I can buy the hat on eBay. Mm-hmm. Six and a half hours of my time is worth a lot of money. You know, it's like, no, we're not doing that. Uh, and and uh, my daughter really wanted me to check out Splatoon 2, which is another Nintendo Switch game. By the way, for my money, I thought Nintendo really won E3. I thought that there was more buzz and more excitement and what Nintendo had going on with the Nintendo Switch and more people. There were more people in the Nintendo booth than like a small country. <laughs> I could not, uh, you know... Uh, I mean, I, I, I couldn't breathe in that booth. There were so many people. It was like uncomfortably crowded all the time. Wow. And, um, you know, uh, I went to the PlayStation booth and that kind of thing. And that was uh, that was fine. By the way, the new Amazing Spider-Man video game for PS4 looks ridiculously cool. That is the one, some of the coolest uh, action gameplay uh, programming I've ever seen in my entire life. That was amazing. Do you, uh, do you play video games in your spare time? I do. I'm a child. I'm a giant. I'm a 47 year old child. It's very true. I, I yeah. do once in a while, but I, it's it's a very dangerous slippery slope for me. If I get started, then it, I just get sucked in, and I just I can't I can't deal with the feeling afterwards that I've wasted like four hours doing nothing. I have a competitive thing. Honestly, ah. uh, I, I have a I have a competitive thing where I have to beat the video game. It's a it's a type A thing. I've never really understood it. So when I start a video game, I have to win. Gotcha. It's it's a thing. I don't know. It's a we can get into my psychosis later, but <laughs> I, I saw the I saw the world famous Intertalk Radio interviewer, Doctor Tu Ho. That's uh, right. She was there, and, and we walked the show a bit together, and we both did a virtual reality um, uh, game, like where you had to put the headset on. And apparently, there there was something with this headset where they treated it with some kind of chemical or whatever. But we we were both coughing and like gonna just like gonna pass out, and, yeah. and it was it, it was there was something completely wrong about whatever chemical they were using to to treat that stuff because I was coughing so at first I was coughing so much and I was like man because it was like a, a game you're running around you're, you're it's a boxing game you're right. boxing and stuff and then I was like man I'm really out of shape I should really be able to do it and then I was coughing so much I was like wait a minute this goes beyond just being old and out of shape we're we're firmly into um, you know airway irritation yeah. and uh medical issues now <sighs> yeah so it was and, and she had the same uh same problem so. yeah she told me about anyway. it. it was really bad I'm, I'm just picturing like some just some like you know uh, uh engineering nerd like let's just spray some lysol in it it'll be fine <laughs> what's this stuff asbestos i think we should make it out of this kids what do you think <laughs> our tech is so hot it's made out of asbestos Oh, you, you need asbestos to handle this tech. That's it's so right. hot. All right, then. Uh, so let's get to it, uh, the show. So anyway, that was E3. E3 was fun. Um, so if you have a question for me, you can always email me at scott at robertsoncom.com, and I'll answer anything right on the show. You can also find all my stuff, my cl- client news clips, posts I'm doing, tidbits, fun stuff, at Robertson.com Facebook page. Um, or you can find me at Twitter at Robertson.com. So reach out and connect. I'm out there. So this one, which is episode 55, I'm calling uh, What You Know For Sure That Just Ain't So. Um, so Mark Twain wrote that, and he said a lot of great things. But basically, what, what he's, his, his quote was, It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So, oh, so true, so true. And then, uh, you know, 
this is very true in marketing communications. There are so many people that labor under mythology and they run their marketing campaigns based on sort of a, um, you know, a bunch of mythology that just isn't true. And it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve you, especially if it's old mythology, because the marketing profession has this nasty little habit of evolving and moving forward. And if you don't evolve and move forward, I know a lot of senior people in marketing are like, well, we'll let the kids figure out the social media. Well, get ready to not be employable. Because you're not going to have the skill set necessary to communicate. In other words, you know, you're throwing rocks and everybody else has a musket, you know, or you've got a musket and everybody else has an AK-47. You know, you, you better learn the weapons if you're going to fight. So um, in this episode of the Emmy nominated show, we're going to talk about a little, we're going to do a little more uh, myth busting and we're going to shake up what we know kind of about what human behavior and stimuli and kind of all this kind of fun stuff. And then we're going to delve into who's winning and losing. And then whatever time's left, I'm going to give you some ways to avoid uh, getting caught by marketing mythology, I think, too. So let's start with some myths. Um, and, and, I, and I run into these a lot. Uh, the first myth that marketing has is that it seems to me that a lot of people in marketing start with the perception that the customer's waking up in the morning and going, you know, you know what I really want today is I really want some marketing. I, 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 I can't live without having some marketing. The customer, so the myth is the customer really wants to hear from us. Allow me to share a secret with you. They do not want to hear from you. Their lives are 100% complete without you and your message. If you didn't exist, if your company didn't exist, they would be fine. Knowing that and assuming that they don't want to hear from you from the beginning puts the responsibility back to us as the marketers to earn our way into their hearts and minds. I don't think there's enough of that. I think there is, um, uh, you know, there's sort of an arrogance that comes with kind of the, the perception of the freeness of communications today that, oh, well, we have a channel and people have liked us. And so now we can just put any crap out and there and it's everything's going to be fine. It's not fine. It's not okay. You must do that marketing thing where we put our creative caps on and think about them. Um, it, you, we must earn our way into this stuff, you know, and, and even if you're paying your way, people get that confused and say, Oh, you just mean public relations and that kind of thing. No, 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 no. I think all messages need to earn their way. All media channels think about it all, you know, every, every media outlet that has to draw an audience to them sits down in the meeting and thinks, how can we be better than our competitors at earning our way and, and earning our place, you know? And, and that kind of thing. They always have that conversation. It's just sometimes marketers think that, that they don't need to do that for some reason. And especially the needs that are emotional and psychological. That's really, really important. Um, as we always talk about in branding. Remember, if you say branding, the next word out of your mouth better be emotion. It better be emotion. It better not be logo. Right? It better be emotion. So we're on the same page. Myth number two. Uh, metrics. Metrics. Um, I know so many companies that say, well, our metrics look really good, so it looks like we're reaching people. Look, we've got this much traffic on this website, and we've got this many web visits and click-throughs and likes and shares and blah, 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 blah. Here is your digital reality check. More than half of the our internet traffic comes artificially from aliens, from space aliens who are waiting for us to figure out which bathroom to use. No, from internet bots which are little software programs that are designed to visit websites lots of times and artificially pump up the numbers, right? Uh, We know that. Everybody knows that. So um, make sure that when you're looking at your metrics, you're counting the metrics that count. Um, I always tell people that I like to measure sales. I love to... Sales is a metric that is like, um, you know, blood pressure for the business, right? Right. Measuring sales is appropriate. And some marketers say, well, Scott, there's so many things that can affect sales. How can we as marketing be expected to blah, 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 whatever. You want to be valuable in a business? Impact sales. You know, you want to be uh, replaceable and you want to have your budget ripped into pieces? Uh, Why don't you start measuring stuff that doesn't lead back to sales in some way? You know, and believe me, I understand that, you know, there are many touch points that can lead up to sales and all those kind of things. But marketing Sometimes there's a disconnect, like we feel like we're not responsible for sales. Like, well, we did our job, you know, like, um, yeah, I'll use my war analogy. Marketing kind of shells the beach and the sales reps go in and fight hand to hand. And we're like, well, we shelled the hell out of the beach. And if they can't win hand to hand, well, that's on them. No, it's on all of us. It's on all of us, right? 
there's no us and them in the sales process. Marketing is a very important part of sales. You don't shell that beach. Your team, it looks like saving Private Ryan in the opening scene, baby. You get mowed down with prejudice. So make sure that you understand that you have a role in sales and you have the absolute right and responsibility, right and responsibility to be fully informed on how sales are going. If a client will let you, there's some clients that won't let you. There's some clients that say, uh, you know what, we're not going to share our sales numbers, that kind of thing. You just keep doing it. I mean, but you always ask. You always ask. You always try to get in there. Get into those metrics. As a business owner myself, there's only one number that matters to me. Sales. Sales. That's what keeps the business open and makes sure that I don't have to go, you know, looking for another job or going to play bass professionally for a living. And that would be a scary living, folks. That's that's a tough. It's tough to make a a living $75 at a time on Friday night. You know what I'm saying? So that's another myth. Myth number three, automating our marketing is a really good thing. Um, I have heard so much BS coming my way on marketing automation lately. It makes me want to physically throw up. Okay. You do not need to be seeking out new ways to send out more garbage. You really don't. There is enough garbage in the world, right? Right. The landfills are overflowing with marketing garbage. Um, and by the way, if you, you know, it's, there comes this cycle where people are sending out stuff. It just goes to a spam filter. It gets instantly deleted or blocked. It gets unsubscribed, does all these kind of things. So it's all this activity, but nobody's actually seeing anything. It's communication that doesn't have a, a beginning or an end. Computers are sending it out. Computers are blocking it. Like, I guess AI is sitting back and going, hey, that was some damn good marketing or whatever. But there's no actual people involved in the circle, right? That is a problema, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you need to make sure that your stuff is good enough that it earns its way, that it attracts things. And again, what are we looking for? Long-term customer relationships through our communications. That is the game that we're playing. That is absolutely the game that we're playing. So don't get sucked in by these autom- marketing automation things that say, oh, when a customer visits this part of your website, we'll send them an email instantly that allows it. Back off. Back off, Mr. Needy. You know what? We'll buy when we're ready. Why don't you just relax? You know, I mean, seriously. Think about this stuff. When people pitch you things that make, you know, quick and easy is a great way to bake a cake and clean a toilet bowl, but it's not the way that you run a marketing campaign. You want to be in there making human decisions. We can make great decisions when we're given the opportunity. And, and marketing automation without human thought is a really bad idea. A really good idea is listening to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. Come on back. We're going to talk about who's winning and who's losing this week. We'll see you in a few. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. 
My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are right here back with May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I am still Scott. We're here in segment two with Paul. We're getting ready to do uh, who's winning and losing. This this episode, we're talking about mythology and stuff that people believe is true that just ain't so. It ain't so. Isn't that right, Paul? Uh, almost none of it is so. Almost none of it is so. Mark Twain, smart guy, got to say. So let's, uh, should we dig right into winning and losing, Paul? I think sure, we should. Sure, I bet there's right. plenty of losers out there. I got some good ones for you. I got some good ones for, for everybody today. All right, so uh, American intelligence is losing in this next one. A startling number of American adults think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. <laughs> No. A recent, yes, a recent dairy organization survey feels uh, straight out of one of those interview skits you see on a late night talk show. Where does chocolate milk come from? The Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy asked a thousand adults in April, and they found that um, uh, that seven percent of American adults think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows, and forty eight percent of adults admitted to not being sure of where chocolate milk comes from. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did they adjust uh, their statistics for uh, for trolls for that seven percent? Oh, I don't. I mean, uh, we have to look at the validity of the study. But come on, people, come on. I, I, here's you know, you always suspect. You know, when you're driving in a freeway next to people, you, you you suspect you're like, I wonder if the world is getting dumber. You know, I wonder if it's actually getting dumber. And then you're like, you see studies like this, you're like. I, I I think the world's getting dumber. I think a case can be made. Well, right? Idiocracy. Yeah. The, the the other thing is the the person that participates in the study about where milk comes from in the first place is already probably in a lower lower percentile. <laughs> I like this story, but I'm going to say that we're all all of our intelligence is probably losing. So we're going to put that in the losing category. Hey, Los Angeles. Um, the infinitely politically correct city of Los Angeles, California, which I just visited this week for the E3 show. And, um, you know, it's even more, it's more crowded every time I go there. It's like they find new ways to put more people in a smaller area every single time. But they are going to replace Columbus Day, you know, Columbus Day, with Indigenous Peoples Day. They uh, voted to push this into the city council, I suppose. And it's a healing process for the Native American community. And uh, basically, it's um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So they're going to not have a city holiday for um, for Columbus, and they're going to have a um, holiday for Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, which from a branding perspective, um, it's a little more difficult, right? Because the word indigenous, it's hard to spell. Nobody knows what the hell it ma- actually means. And uh, and peoples plural is also not used very much. So you've you've already got you got two big branding issues in the name. One, you got a crazy word that nobody can spell, uh, and you got mis- Americans that think the chocolate milk comes from brown cows, so they don't have a chance in hell of being able to spell indigenous, ladies and gentlemen. And now we got <laughs> People's Day and People's Day without any kind of apostrophe or anything. Peoples as like a plural of people, which is not again not a construction that's used. So now you've got Columbus Day, which everybody pretty much got and could do. And now you've got Indigenous Peoples Day. You got branding issues everywhere associated with this thing. The biggest branding issue that you have is that the rest of the country doesn't celebrate it. So you you've got kind of L.A. Um, once again going. Well, we're so politically correct that uh, you know we're gonna take this national holiday, uh, banking banking holiday. Really, is how I always think of it. You know, banking holiday, and we're gonna call it something else because, and you know, we're politically correct like that, and yay for us. Aren't we great? Uh, I'm going to put that in losing. 
that's got a lot of brand issues associated with it. If you're the communications team that's responsible for pushing Indigenous Peoples Day, you're already starting out with both hands tied behind your back. Just from the English language is already working against you. You need that you should have done a little bit more thinking in terms of, um, you know, uh, how do we make this into it either a two word phrase or a phrase that actually works within the English language. So I would have done it. Put that in losing. Sorry, L.A. And seriously, does everybody have to be at L.A. at the same time? Can we take shifts? Good God. Hate going to that place. Um, McDonald's, you know, your friend with the hamburgers, they are exiting their longtime Olympic partnership. They um, are parting ways with the International Olympic Committee, and they are no longer loving it, as they say. I didn't make that. That's stupid journalism in the story. Um, so the, the breakup is a huge shift for Mickey D's, which has been sponsoring the U.S. Olympic Committee since 1976, and they've been a, pot, a partner with the IOC uh, since 1996. Both of those relationships basically end effectively immediately. So it either opens the door for, um, like, you know, like somebody like uh, Subway or, um, you know, uh, I don't know, somebody else to come in and, and take that Olympic partnership um, nut. But it is kind of interesting because you've, you know, think about it. You've you've always had um, this these large cornerstone brands like McDonald's um, uh, associated with it. Now, there's been a few other major um, big name sponsors that have bailed from the Olympics: uh, Budweiser, City Bank, you know, City, Hilton, TD Ameritrade, and AT and T. Um, so. From a trend study you know, uh, standpoint, from marketing wise, you can see that these big brands now. Why are they ending these sponsorships? Millions and millions of dollars. They're obviously not getting what they perceive to be millions and millions of dollars worth of value. Uh, remains to be seen. Now, what are the, what's the um, IOC going to do? Are they going to, you know, offer this up to smaller advertisers? Are they, you know, we talk about advertising dollars only. You know, what kind of packages are they going to put together? But uh, anyway, you won't be seeing McDonald's on that. I'm going to put that in. Um, I guess sort of losing for the IOC, definitely losing for the IOC because they've lost some really big sponsor names with a lot of zeros behind them. But anyway, that's kind of an interesting one. All right, let's uh, let's talk about Fruit Loops. What other show can 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 lead you in and say let's talk about Fruit Fruit Loops? Um, I like what Fruit Loops is doing. They are um, uh, doing a um, they're doing a lot of cool things. Fruit Loops is uh, aside from they they market a version of Fruit Loops now that has a little mini marshmallows that I tried recently. Um, you know, it's not healthy in any capacity, but it's uh, it's tasty. I mean, I will say that. Um, so, Fruit Loops is creating um, uh, you know special Facebook and Instagram accounts, and they're offering their first Snapchat lens which is um, under the hashtag, whatever fruits your loops. See, you get it there. Uh, it's kind of cool. They, they developed an emoji keyboard, which features Toucan Sam, images of Fruit Loops, whimsical animations for use in text messages and social posts. So trying to get more people to, you know, get excited about the characters and the, and the, feel, the childlike enthusiasm of the brand so that you'll, you know, won't think about all that sugar and that's it's going to turn to all that fat. Uh, but anyway, it, I thought... It's pretty interesting to see what kind of a traditional consumer product like um, Fruit Loops is is doing out there. So I'm putting in winning because I thought it was cool. Twitter, you know, your friends at Twitter, they are rolling out new, um, better designed apps. Um, you know, they're cleaning up their look. They're enabling people to uh, block ads uh, with on, on web pages opened within iOS apps. So on Twitter, they began rolling out a redesign of mobile apps. You may have seen that already. And also their, um, they own TweetDeck, you know, which is the big dashboard. So if you run multiple Twitter accounts like I do, um, you use something like TweetDeck or Hootsuite or something. TweetDeck's pretty sweet, though. You know, you can load in a bunch of different Twitter accounts. And without having to go in and load in, you know, and stuff, you, you can send out posts in sort of a dashboard-esque uh, manner. It's been around for a long time. As a, It was an independent first, and then Twitter bought it. Uh, very, very cool, uh, cool thing. But what's interesting about this to me is that, you know, Twitter, which sells advertising, which has been trying to sell advertising for a good long time, is now running out, rolling out versions, especially on the iOS side, which blocks advertising. So you've got kind of an interesting juxtaposition between an organization that wants to sell advertising. They realize people don't want advertising. People are going to start using the app. They need the audience for the app. They know they need to have the people to, uh, you know, to possibly 
I need to have the audience. So they, they give them a version that blocks ads, but then they, at the same time they sell ads. Um, interesting, right? I got to say, um, for, for, from Twitter's perspective, I'm going to put that in winning because Twitter is, uh, is rolling out these new apps and, and obviously looking at what their audience wants, which I think is always a good thing. Adam West uh, passed away this week, and it was really, really cool. All the the, um, the PR last night in Los Angeles, um, they lit up the bat signal uh, in, on City Hall in tribute to the late Adam West, you know, who, of course, famously played Batman in the 1960s, you know, that campy TV show, uh, the Batman show. Um, did such a great job, you know, with, with Batman, obviously. And uh, such a fun, I mean, all of us remember that show. Well, if you're a millennial, you're like, I'm sorry, old man, I don't know what the hell it is you're talking about. But if you are a, um, you know, not quite that young, you remember the show a little bit still. So you you uh, you know what we're talking about when you talk, to, talk about Adam West. So the, the they lift the bat signal. They had the Batmobile show up. I thought it was a really nice tribute. Every news outlet in Los Angeles uh, covered it. And I'm pretty sure um, nationwide it was covered pretty uh, pretty widely as well. But um, we're going to put that in uh, – I mean, obviously, the world is losing because of Adam West. You know, he's 88 years old. Uh, you know, he's certainly going to be missed and certainly, um, you know, uh, a legend icon. But I thought it was really, really cool the way that Los Angeles chose to honor him and, uh, you know, very unforgettable for, uh, you know, for, for his family and for everybody uh, just to kind of say one last tribute to the Batman, to the first Batman. Well, we're going to put that in and losing, I guess. Um, you know, who's winning is Amazon. Man, Amazon. Amazon is going to buy, uh, they just announced today they're going to buy Whole Foods for $13.7 billion. What I'm going to do is buy Whole Foods for $13.7 billion, Mr. Powers. Great. So um, they're getting into the grocery business in a really big way. Now, check this out. This is what's interesting is that they got over 400 retail locations in this purchase. So they spent $13.7 billion, but they got these retail locations. Their stock uh, jumped this morning on the news of this. In fact, they got enough money for the purchase on the stock jump. Um, So I thought that was kind of really, really interesting. Also, if you're in the grocery business, you should really take notice now. Because now you've got this um, incredible logistical juggernaut of Amazon firmly in your space. It's absolutely done. You know, you know, Walmart has said recently, Walmart said recently that it is going to, you know, step up a way to, you know, ways to go after Amazon. And it was thought that the food and grocery side of things would be a competitive advantage for Walmart, given that they own or, you know, they own so many suppliers. They're able to, you know, do a lot of things and, you know, have this you know you know when you look at re- at physical retail it's like the bar crap is like walmart huge huge monster bar and everybody else is like at halfway down their bar right that's i mean that's just always how it has been especially because of this grocery piece which is a very big piece for them now amazon that owns uh, whole foods now um is is really kind of interesting um i'm not a whole foods shopper I have to say, I find their stuff to be kind of overpriced and kind of overhyped. And um, I always feel like, uh, I mean, I I get it. I know why some people shop there. I kind of find Trader Joe's to be a little better personally. And and I do shop at the Walmart. Um, you know, my, our family shops at the Walmart Family Market, uh, you know, right here. We, we're not big Whole Foods people. Um I also find the food a little bit like, you know, they have the little cafes inside Whole Foods. Sometimes people always say, let's meet for breakfast over at Whole Foods. And every time I eat there, I'm like, why can't I taste this? Why does this taste like garbage? And, and, I, uh, and I equate that experience to the rest of Whole Foods business model. I apologize if that's not accurate, if you guys are listening and that's not accurate or whatever. But I, that's the perception I have because of the, the poor uh, – food experience I've had. I'm not the healthiest eater in the world either. Got to gotta just throw that out there, which obviously you know because of the Fruit Loops comment earlier, but I'm just saying that, you know, Whole Foods, what am I saying now? I'm saying that Amazon did a good thing by buying Whole Foods. I think that that is a good thing for their business, and it'd be really, really interesting to see what kind of innovations they're going to be able to bring to Whole Foods, uh, you know, it's been said that grocery stores are the most inefficient logistical. You buy the same 
products uh, you know, every week and you have to physically go there and you have to phys- physically fill up bags and you have to get check out and then you have to distribute it back to your own ha- house. And so everybody's looking for a way that they can kind of get in on that and everybody needs to buy food, right? And nobody likes to go buy food. So um, that's kind of interesting. I think it will be very interesting to watch. We're going to put it in winning, certainly winning because of that stock uh, push. My goodness. Man, oh man. There has been quite a media bloodbath lately. I don't know if you guys know, watch this or not, but there are a lot of journalism jobs going more a lot more journalism jobs going away. Um, Time is laying off or buying out three hundred people. Uh, Huff Post just laid off thirty nine people. Um, you know uh, what's behind it? What's behind it? Basically, there is. Um, what this uh, there's a CEO of a trade organization called Digital Content Next, um, who did a uh, an email statement back to uh, to the Pointer um, uh, organization that said uh, there's a clear correlation between layoffs and buyoffs with the growth um, in market share for the duopoly Google and Facebook. So, isn't that interesting? Google and Facebook uh, accounted for approximately 71 percent of all digital advertising sales in the United States during the first quarter of 2017, and 82 percent of the growth of all digital advertising. So, all the ad dollars are going to these groups, which we just, we, we talked about earlier in the show, right? Who likes advertising? Yeah, nobody, right? So, um, uh, it's kind of interesting, right? That they that all the uh, the ad dollars are going there, but what it's having an unintended consequence, and it's cutting all of our journalistic jobs. It's really dangerous for society not to have a free press. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big critic of our journalism, particularly in our political um, coverage, but it's even more dangerous um, to not have a lot of viewpoints being able to be expressed. Uh, so I think we should watch that really, really closely. You start losing all the journalists from the media outlets, and there better be some place for them to express those opinions. Otherwise, you start to get these conglomerates, and man, oh man, it's just going to be... It's going to be crazy. And the last one I have, so we're going to put that in losing. Sorry uh, for all the journalism jobs that are going away because of Google and Facebook punks. United Airlines is back in the news remarkably with another bit of stupidity. They had to cancel a flight to Italy when terrified passengers saw fuel gushing out of the wing of the plane just before takeoff. And, of course, what happened to that? Who took a picture of it? Everybody took a picture of it. There's lots of pictures of it. Go check it out. Uh, Everybody tweeted about it. There's fuel. There's jet fuel flying out of the wing. If they fire the engines and there's jet fuel um, going out of the wing, what happens? Science fans. What happens? Kaboom. Everybody dies. That's right. That's exactly what happens. So it's like, United, what's the matter with you? What is the matter with you on so many levels? So many levels. We don't have enough adequate time on this show to address what's wrong with you. But right now you're tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I am Scott, and we will be back to give you some ways to avoid getting caught by marketing myths. See you in a few. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have have the gear to get you into the game from leading manufacturers like mesa boogie fender pioneer and american audio to sound your best you need the best pitbull audio can deliver in rehearsal on stage and into the big time dropping beats shredding guitar or making the crowd roar whatever you dream pitbull audio can help make it happen we are pitbull audio we want you to play it loud pitbullaudio.com make this your vinyl night i'm john gr robinson and every week music creation comes alive through stories experiences and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds my friends and i share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as michael jackson eric clapton quincy jones and steve winwood to name a few 
Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Miola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Happy Friday. You are tuned to Made the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader on Music Biz Talk. I am still Scott, your host for segment three here, and we were just talking about who's winning and losing. Paul, what did you, what what horrified you? What'd you like? What's going on? Uh, the Amazon Whole Things is pretty huge. I didn't know about that. Uh, yeah, it's huge, huge. The the United thing. I think I, I sent that to you the the other day. I don't know if I if I was the the first person you heard it from or, or if you knew about it already. But I I, I <laughs> you did you did yeah no I did I, I saw that story. and I was just you did I was just shaking my head. I was like come I mean. You, you, it's just like a pylon now. It's like I don't know how anybody flies that airline. And and the, th- the thing is, I read that's funny. Is like they they tried they tried being nice for like five minutes to the people that. Well, so at first <laughs> at first these people were trying to get get the crew's attention. Like there's, uh, you know, yeah, fuel yeah, shooting out yeah. of the wing, and they're like, Miss, sit down, be quiet, shut up. <laughs> and they're like, no, and it's like I'm picturing the, the scene fr- from uh, to- the that's Twilight awesome. Zone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. There's a gremlin on there's the wing. Gremlin and like, on the wing. They're like, sit down, and you're like, you're, you're like, there is fuel gushing from the freaking wing. Please don't light the engines. <laughs> I went to live. <laughs> So then, so then, oh when God. they finally realized that there is fuel gushing out of the of the wings, they tried being nice to these people for like five. They managed for like ten minutes to, yeah, yeah. to be nice, yeah. and then when it t- came time to actually like reaccommodating them and putting them on a, on giving up, they had to like sleep on the floor of of the air, airport. They couldn't oh, put no. them on a the flight. They oh, couldn't no. put them in the hotel. <laughs> they just can't can't seem to do anything right. There is, uh, I, I posted in a, in a PR forum, people were talking about this and they said, what do you think United, you know, PR people, what do you think United should do? And I said, you should rebrand and just re-everything. There's few companies where you just need to start over. Or just go home. But that's, that's one. Just that's go, one. Just, you should just start over. Just go home. Either that just or go. or uh, tr- try to get, get your uh, all your actuaries to calculate how much money you would have lost if your plane went out, went up in flames with all these people on board. Uh, take half of that money and give it to the people that that got the crew's attention, and you're still better no. off. There you go. They just need to. They just need to get into a room together and go. Okay, we we're not we're not doing a good job with this airline. So let's start over. What does this thing look like? You know, and and just they just need to start over. New name, new new everything, new culture. Fire that CEO. They, good. They should. Uh, they should. They should take over Guantanamo Bay. They'll be good at that. There you go. There you go. Or find a new business model. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, geez, I don't know how anybody flies there at United Airlines. And you're not just thinking, come on, man. I mean, there's just there's just too many there's too many mistakes and too many, too much dumbness it did- floating around for it just to be uh, you know uh, located on somebody else. It's going to hit you eventually. Yeah, and it's it's systemic. It seems like uh, with all airlines, like like air travel just gotten really really bad over the past bu- bunch of years. With no matter what you fly, unless you could you know afford to fly business or first class, which I can't. But it seems just like it's just terrible across the board. You know what? If you're in business class, that you still burn just the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically enough, Pro- even you're, you're, probably you're, even faster because you have more cash paper on you. Dude, you still catch on fire at the same degree that the coach passengers do. I guarantee you that. <laughs> that is not good news. I have to fly uh, next month. I have to fly to Summernam, and uh, you know I'm going to Nashville. Yay! I am too. And, uh, you know. Oh, cool. Hey, yeah, we'll see you there. We'll get, we'll get a beer over there. So uh, you know, 
and, and I'm just dreading it. I'm like, I got. Uh, I'm, I'm flying Southwest. What do you What are you flying? Southwest up as well. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll get lucky. Mm-hmm. Southwest has much fewer issues. Uh, it seems to have a little bit fewer issues. Yeah, I, I, I can't envision a scenario. And I know people say, "Oh, branding doesn't matter, Scott. I, I be, people, it's convenience and prices and flights." I can't envision a scenario where I fly United Airlines. <laughs> I can't envision it. I can't envision it. And I don't care if the client said, "You need to be there tomorrow." United Airlines is the only one. I'd be like, "Is there a you know? Is there a bus?" Is there a you know is there is there something else I'd be looking for alternate transportation can we charter a flight can we do something else I am not flying that airline they scare the crap out of me <laughs> just there's no way I'm, I mean I'm, there's no way there's no way I'm flying them ever so anyway if some people are I guess, a little more bold than uh, you know than I am or don't care as much but in this episode we we digress we are talking about we're talking about myths and what you know for sure that really ain't so you know mark twain said it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble it's what you know for sure that just ain't so so this whole episode has been about that we talked about a few myths at the top of the show um there's a lot more by the way but those are a couple that are you know bothering me these days um but here are a few ways that you can not get caught by marketing mythology um because it's everywhere i have people um uh, uh just one more that I'll say, and I've said this on the show before, but if you run a B2B brand, there is a mythology that says that you have to be quote unquote professional and quote unquote serious or people won't take you seriously. That is garbage. There isn't a lick of neuroscientific truth to that. There is, you know, we are not serious people, people. We aren't, you know, I don't care what you pretend to be during the work week. I know the truth. The truth is that we're all sort of goofy and messed up, and that's why we like, you know, Borat and 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 things like that. I saw Borat, by the way. Um, check this out. This is a unique uh, life experience. I saw the movie Borat in a theater in Salt Lake City, Utah, with a bunch of people that I don't think they knew what the what the movie was. And by the time the movie was over, you know, Borat's really. Uh, you know, disgusting and deep. And it's, it's really funny too, but it's, but you know, it's that. So, and I'm in Salt Lake city, Utah. I was the only one left in the theater by the time the movie ended. Everybody else got up and left. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know why I told that story. I just, it just, it, cause I mentioned Borat. That's what, that's what um, got me thinking about it. But um, allow me to free you. If you are a um, B2B marketer, you can be not serious. You can be fun. You can you can you can appeal to emotions. In fact, you should, because a lot of B two B marketing is really boring and just it's just uh, 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 terrible. And it just doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. You absolutely can have fun with it. You can absolutely do you know a lot of things with B two B. You know, send me an email if you have a, a tough case and you're like, well, I work in a really boring industry, and um, I love challenges like that. By the way. I call it the B2B boredom challenge. You know, if you work in a tough industry and you don't think we can make it interesting together, call me. I bet you I can. I, I've done it with some in- industries that you wouldn't suspect had a, had the story that we came up with for them. Uh, and it's much better. And it makes the business more successful and that whole marketing stuff works a lot better. But let's give you a few tips. Some, how, about, how about five ways to avoid getting caught by marketing myths? One of the first ways is to follow the entire marketing process and be careful of anything that's going to shortcut the marketing process. Um, You know, follow your steps, you know, your research step, your planning step, your execution step, your measurement step, right? Um, And there's a lot of different variations on that, I realize. But make sure that you're doing those four things, you know, in everything that you're doing in marketing. That stuff is real, real important. And I know there's a lot of, you know, young whippersnappers and digital marketers that think they can shortcut the process. Allow me to drop some truth on the kids. The marketing process, which is based in human psychology, cannot be shortcutted by digital anything. So we're on the same page. You know, it really can't. Be careful of anything that tries to shortcut it. Those are people who want you as a marketer, they want your money as a marketer. And whether it's successful or not, who really cares for them? You know, they they want your money. 
um, as a service provider to you, they don't care about your client relationships because that's not their business. You're their relationship and them selling you is their business. Make sure you understand that when you're dealing with marketing automation, by the way. Um, and always Jurassic Park lo logic, right? Scott Robertson's Jurassic Park logic, just because we can make dinosaurs doesn't mean we should make dinosaurs. What happens when you make dinosaurs just because you can? You've seen the movies. Do they, do they turn out well for the people that made the dinosaurs? They do not. Uh, it's, it's a disaster, um, right? Use that Jurassic Park lo logic. There's a lot of things in this world that we can do. Don't get caught up in what you can do. Always think about what you should do. Very, very important. Very, very important. I see that rule broken almost on a daily basis. Just people not thinking about it, not taking the time to think through it. Very important. Number two, get your message right. You know, marketing mythology, um, you know, of it's almost always built around an, an I, all these myths that we're talking about. You can you can dispel those and get around those if you have a if you have a really good message. If you really understand why you're there, what you're supposed to be doing, why we're connecting with people, and all those kind of fundamentals, it's so easy to skip that stuff, people. It's so easy for marketers to jump right past all of that messaging stuff and go, um, you know, I had a conversation with an organization this week and, and they're like, yeah, well, you know, the first thing out of their mouth, they're like, they're like, oh, we need a website and we need a one sheet and we need, and we need corporate identity and we need to look at the logo. We need to do all this, all, but, 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 you know, bah, 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 machine gun full of tactics. And I said, hold on, what's the message? And he was like, oh, well, you know, uh, yeah. and, and, and people just start, start stumbling. And I said, you know, are you in such a hurry to communicate that you're not going to form a sentence before you do so? Figure it out. You only get one shot. You know, you, first impressions, man, first impressions. Don't get so excited to communicate that you forget to, com to create something. You know, I use my archery analogy. My archery analogy is like this. People are so excited to jump up to that target and start firing arrows at that sucker, man. Boom, 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 arrow, 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 arrow. And I come to them and I'm like, you know, have we even looked at these arrows? You know, are we, uh, you know, are they sharp enough? Are they, uh, do they have the right number of feathers? You know, have, have we looked at this thing that we're going to inflict upon people and make sure that it is the right thing for them? You know, have we really dug into this and done our due diligence? In my experience, the answer is no. The answer is almost always no. As, as I say on the show a lot of times, if there's one problem I solve all the time, it's the fact that people have built a second and third level on their house and there's no damn foundation for it to stand on. So it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, the foundation is really important. It's really important. Don't skip it ever, no matter who is asking you to. Very important. Get the message right. Message, message, message. I spend a lot of time on message. You can't do too much of that, honestly. Number three, ways to not get caught by any kind of marketing myths. One way that you'll never get caught is that you're having empathy for the audience. You're thinking about the audience first. Uh, you know, every communications effort in 2017 needs to begin with uh, what uh, uh, with us putting ourselves mentally in the position of the people that we're about to inflict our will upon right we're about to we're about to interrupt their day we're about to we're about to send something through that we know they don't completely want so if we're that person how do we feel when we get that you know what and, and then, and then, just deeper, just to get in that message and stuff. What is it that we need? What is it that we want? What is it that we are? That, and, and and is there a fit between what this company does and what we want? Right? The um, you know, that when we always talk about brand messaging, that fit between the I am statements that people want to be true about themselves and what the brand is putting out there. Really, really important. Empathy, 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 uh, and that will always help you not get caught in some marketing mythology. Um, another way not to get caught by marketing myths is to challenge everything, you know, be one of those people. Uh, I'm one of those people. You listen to my show, you know, I challenge everything. I don't take anything for granted. Um, you know, when, when people tell me it's so, 
I ask a lot of questions, um, like a journalist asks questions, like, well, how do we know that? And, and where, and where do we know that? And, and people can say, well, you know, that, you know, is that being obstinate? No, that's being, you know, that's being a counselor. That's being a counselor. You know, uh, remember the fable about the emperor is wearing new clothes. He had surrounded himself with yes people and, and, and the, um, the, the little con man comes to town and says, oh, well, um, th- these are the best, finest clothes I could design for you. And, and they're, they're air. They're nothing. And then everybody around the emperor, the emperor's like, well, don't these clothes look really fantastic on me? And everybody around him's like, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. They're, 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 you know, they, you look, you've never looked better. You never looked better. Yes, man. Kiss butt. Kiss butt. You know, that kind of thing. You know, and, and then, you know, the emperor walks out to meet the public and, uh, you know, is naked, isn't wearing any clothes. And then a little child and a child shall lead them said, the emperor is not wearing any clothes. And right, and, and all the people were going along with it too. And then a kid said, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. The emperor's naked. And then everybody kind of caught on and realized that, right? Challenge things. Challenge things. If your CEO comes in into things and thinks that the message should be this, challenge it. Just because they're the CEO does not make them the marketing expert. In fact, in my experience, they are not the marketing expert. Be the marketing expert. That's why they hired you, you know? Um, I always tell people, you know, if the CEO wants to be the marketing expert, go be that. I'm busy enough, you know, but if you want, if you need uh, counsel, if you need expert marketing expertise, you know, like like in a band, if you're holding down the baseline, don't bring in Scott to play bass because you're playing bass, you know, but if you're like, I need a bass player. Yes. Now we're talking. Now there's a role. There's a, there's a role, that kind of thing. But I'm also not going to sit there and say, yeah, yeah, everything's great and everything's, everything's good. I'm going to counsel. I'm going to push back and I'm going to challenge everything. And you should too. Always challenge stuff. Things like, or oh, marketing isn't professional enough. It's crap, just so you know. Uh, number five, always keep learning. You know, always make sure one way not to get caught by marketing myths is to make sure that what you know doesn't turn into what you knew. Uh, our profession moves very, very quickly. Things change. Amazon buys Whole Foods. Twitter, you know, creates an ad blocking thing. Stay up on stuff. This is a game for people who are st- want to be well steeped in the latest stuff that's going on. Not people who knew something twenty years ago about marketing. That world doesn't exist anymore. Don't use that knowledge today. It's it's, it's not going to help you. You know what have we learned today? Challenging dumb myths is one way we can all improve the profession. You know, I advise my clients to use marketing communications very carefully. Always be aware of the sharp edges that can always come back to cut you while you're busy cutting through the clutter. You know, know your fundamentals. Why are we special? What's our emotional core that we're trying to hit? Again, temper that with a good deal of empathy for the audience. Put their needs always above yours. Put what they need always first. It's so important. It makes our communications tolerable and possibly even great. Missing those things is going to add to the garbage pile. It's going to bring about more blocking, more regulations, and simply more control on a profession that has a lot of con- lot of trouble controlling itself. That's it for me, marketing fans. Until next week, this has been Scott Robertson, host of May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Radio, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week with a fresh show. Rock and roll. See ya. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. 
Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie's Groove.com. Ready to get your groove on?